We're out here at the Provo City Center Temple, and we're doing evangelism on a Thursday night, but it, the foot traffic's kind of low, and it, it seems like there's a lull, so hey, let's make a video. We're handing out these purple tracks, among others. Can we trust our feelings? I love, I used, actually, it used to be my least favorite track to hang out of the six set, uh, and then it became one of my favorite. Uh, it, it, it's more uh, relevant than just to Latter-day Saints. It's, of course, it's, it's relevant to lots of people, but uh, one of the things that I say when I summarize the track for someone, when I say, hey, can I, can I summarize the track for you? As I'll say that we need to submit our feelings under the Lordship of Jesus. That for Jesus to be Lord means that he's boss, that he's risen from the dead, he's coming back to judge the living and the, and the dead. He's, um, he gets final say, his word is authoritative, my feelings uh, ought to bend the knee to Jesus. My, Jesus is not to bend the knee to my feelings. Uh, precisely because he is Lord, uh, I should be transformed by the renewal of my mind, which means if I uh, find some feeling in me that, that doesn't love someone that it should love or ought to love someone it doesn't, or if I feel pleasure in something that's sinful that I shouldn't feel pleasure in, there's all sorts of feelings that go backwards. So I'm, I am called by Christ to... Uh, take up my cross, to crucify the flesh. To, Paul says to put to death the deeds of the flesh in Romans 8. Well, one of the deeds of the flesh is uh, false uh, feelings, uh, feelings that are not rooted in truth, feelings that uh, might seem like they're pleasurable. Uh, what do you have to say on this topic, Luke? Uh, I, like you, I love bringing this into conversation. And so uh, it's especially with, with LDS missionaries, it's often I'll begin by laying on the table my final authority. If you want to convince me of anything, just find it here. If you could show me in context in the scripture that something is true, I will accept it. Now, all I ask in return, just so we're not talking past each other, is what is your final authority? Where does the buck stop? And very often it is with the idea of an inner spiritual testimony, a subjective inner experience that when you ask, when you put press and ask to describe it is a feeling, a, 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 an emotion, a sensation that they got. An epiphany. Yes. Um, and so, you know, I like to go to the text of scripture because if, if God has spoken where our Lord always went was, um, you know, have you not read? He pointed to the very word of God, what, what God spoke. And uh, never have you not felt, but have you not read? Uh, and so I like to look in places like in uh, Proverbs uh, 28, 26, where it says, Whoever trusts in his own heart is a fool, but he who walks in wisdom will be delivered. Uh, or Jeremiah seventeen nine, which says um, that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick who can know it who can understand it and so we're we're warned explicitly against following trusting in our own heart our own inner self our own inner experiences and so therefore whatever i feel just as you were saying whatever even seemingly supernatural inner sensation or experience or epiphany or enlightenment that I may have, that I, that is held in check by what God has plainly spoken. What is it in 2 Thessalonians 2? Uh, is that it? In verse, I might have the chapter wrong. 2 Thessalonians 2, it says in verse 10, they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Therefore, God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Really interesting there is that this person who's being judged with you know, God sending them a strong delusion, they have a feeling. It's a feeling of pleasure, but it's a pleasure in unrighteousness. This person ought to have evaluated his pleasant feelings uh, with truth. He, he ought not to have evaluated truth with, with his pleasant feelings. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I got a question for you. Uh, a lot of Latter-day Saints will say, well, hey, what about the fruit list, the fruits of the Spirit list in Galatians? Uh, does that not mean we should uh, judge or evaluate, discern truth based off positive feelings? 
Yes, I've, I've, I've heard this as well. And the ar- argument generally goes th- that the list of the fruit of the Spirit, that's the fruit of the true Spirit. And so if you feel those things, that can't be a deceitful Spirit. That would have to be the true Spirit of God because a deceitful Spirit can't produce those feelings. Now, what's the assumption being smuggled in here? That the fruit list is a list of feelings. But if we actually read the text that's in Galatians 5 here, uh, says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of a flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Now, what are we talking about? The feelings of the flesh? Works. Now, the works of the flesh are evident. Um, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissentiousness, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things of this like. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who who, uh, belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh and its passions and desires. So, first of all, these list of things are character traits produced by the Spirit in you not a list of feelings that the Spirit will use to communicate with you. This is a list of character traits that someone who already believes and is filled with the Spirit of God will have produced by the Spirit in them. And it goes on to say that one of the things that the Spirit leads you to do is to crucify the flesh and its passions. So those feelings, to put those, put your feelings aside, to put those down and instead walk in the, the what God, what His Spirit would lead you to do and those are the character traits as defined by Scripture. Also of note, uh, it lists self-control. Self-control often is not a good feeling. It, it, it is something that you're doing with, with tremendous discipline and yes. grit. Yes. And I mean, by God's grace, it's, it's uh, done even when it doesn't feel good. Absolutely. Absolutely. We've got uh, some other passages here. First Thessalonians 5.21 on the track. It says, test everything, hold fast to what is good. I, I would assume here that among the everything to test is our feelings. One of the things I like to ask uh, com- a conversation or conversation partner is, are your feelings infallible? Are your feelings inerrant? Or uh, have you ever been wrong? <laughs> or have your feelings ever been wrong? Have your feelings ever led you astray? One of the examples I gave just for fun conversation with BYU students is, you know, sometimes a guy says to a lady, um, God told me or God revealed to me uh, or I feel as though God wants me to marry you, like you're the one. And uh, students will, they, they recognize that as a, as a common happening that just doesn't always end well. Uh, God told me to marry you. I feel, I feel that God told me to, that you're the one. Some, yeah, the, the, it, we have other examples in life of very sincere people who feel very deeply about something being wrong. Yeah. Yeah. And and, you know, if you're, the claim is that these feelings that I have, well, this wasn't just, I know my feelings, I have emotions all the time, but this was a spiritual testimony. This was different than anything I felt before. Now, that doesn't actually mean that it, just because it's new that it isn't an emotion. But let's say you're right, that it's a spiritual testimony. We have a command in 1 John 4, Beloved, do not believe every spirit but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. And so if you have this inner spiritual testimony telling you that a new prophet is true, you are commanded to test that spirit, not to simply accept what it says because it feels good, not to to test that spirit, to put that spirit to the test, that that is a, a command of scripture. You are sinning, you're being disobedient to God if you do not put that spirit to the test. Now, I don't want to give the impression to our viewers, we haven't given the impression, but some people think that in light of this approach to feelings, that the Christian life, in our view, maybe is just cerebral or platonic or boring or scholarly uh, in the the scholastic boring sense. Um, Or, uh, you know, people have this image of people going to church and just kind of being disengaged or 
approaching uh, matters of ultimate importance, not existentially. I actually think that if you, this is really ironic, but if you don't let your feelings rule you and instead you're being conformed uh, to scripture and being conformed after the rene- renewal of your mind by the Holy Spirit, if if you're submitting your feelings to the word of God and you're training your feelings to obey the Lord Jesus Christ, you're actually in a better position to throw your whole existential self and all of the most, uh, all of the deepest passions and the intensity of love towards something. You can aim it at something and fire on all cylinders and, and not be re- reserved about it. Because I know that is the objective truth, because I know that God's promises are true and that he doesn't lie and that he will uh, come, he will bring to pass what he has promised. I can uh, preach my heart out. I can plead with tears. I can pray earnestly. Um, I can uh, I can sing the songs of lament. Uh, I can, uh, I, and not a lot of people, this is foreign to them. Uh, I can praise with joy. I mean, it, that's that. It almost just seems insincere to people to see a bunch of Christians praising Jesus. Oh, that's just, you know, religious uh, feelings that are worked up. No, for Christians uh, to, to, to sing all glory be to Christ, uh, to sing holy, 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 Amen. to be with the brothers and take uh, the, the bread and the cup together, to be under the preaching of the word, uh, to have a feast together unto the Lord, uh, to sit in a circle and pray for each other, uh, to go deep and, I mean, I, I even think about repentance. This is another one. Repentance uh, is a turning of the heart. It's a, it's a, it's a turning the ship of, of the feelings. And that doesn't feel very good often. Um, but I'm not sure where it's going with that. But it, it, uh, repentance itself is a reorientation of my feelings. It's, it's putting my, my, uh, my belief and my will uh, behind my feelings. And it's steering the ship of the heart and saying, Lord, please, please give me um, feelings for this. Actually, one more thing I thought to share is I was speaking to a Latter-day Saint in front of the BYU Stadium last week, and we talked about whether Heavenly Father had a, uh, a past where he was perhaps a sinner or where he was perhaps less than God. That he was, that was God, is God the kind of God that has ancestors? Was he a hand-me-down God? Was he a hand-me-down artist? Did, did he learn what he knows from someone else? And we just went through scriptures where God says in Isaiah, he's never learned anything. He can't be likened to another. He's the first and the last. It says elsewhere, he's never received a gift. And it ended by him saying, I just don't feel like that's relevant to my salvation. I, I just don't, that doesn't really land on me. He, to the effect he said, I just don't feel like that matters. And so what I did is I encouraged him to pray that God would change his heart, that he would repent. And in that repentance, go to Christ and say, Jesus, save me from the apathy that I have of the lack of feelings that I have over a concern for the truth of who God is. Yeah, I mean, you look at how thrilled, overflowing with joy and enthusiasm, Paul is when he speaks of the very attributes of God that you're talking about right here. And at the end of Romans 11, when he says, oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? No one obviously, Uh, who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid for from him and through him and to him are all things to him be glory forever. Amen. You can't read that as a sort of somber chant. You can't read that without that. There's feeling. There's, there's, there's joy, there's delight, there's a zeal for the knowledge of his God and a wonder that thrills to know more about God. So yes, there is much feeling in the Christian life. And the same Paul can write, as you mentioned earlier, that, uh, you know, as I've told you before, I tell you again, even with tears, that there are those who live as enemies of the cross, of the cross of Christ, that he, he, he weeps over the fact of those who he is rebuking and correcting, those who he is seeking to steer right because they presently live as enemies of the cross of Christ. There is much emotion, but it is emotion submitted to truth that follows truth. And, and such rightly oriented emotion that is focused in the place and on the things that God would have it is, is it, it's, it's better. It's more a delight 
it's it, grief is more pure and right grief. Um, um, anger is righteous anger, and and we the fullness of human experience and all the emotions that come with it when they're rightly placed as God would have them, submitted to the truth of His Word. I would say we can be we could be more passionate and more true to 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 our humanity. And, and on the flip side, when we're in a time of spiritual famine, uh, a desert, we're going through a dark, uh, dry season, um, and I'm, I'm just not feeling it, um, I can still have the gospel, and I can still trust yes. the gospel. Um, so there might be a season where, where I, I'm begging God to fill me with the Spirit and to renew my spirit, right? And, and to, to give me a right, uh, what, is, what does David say? Uh, renew a right spirit within me. Mm-hmm. Um, but because my belief isn't based on feelings right. and because the truth isn't based on feelings, there's a, that's a better long-term path. And I think the, the, the end game there is that uh, I can have the long-term feelings that follow truth, that don't, they're not, they're not with the train and the caboose and the, mm-hmm. what's the other one? Uh, <laughs> the one in the front, one in the back. I want the feelings to be in the back and I want the truth to be in the front. Uh, I would actually, uh, let's throw a criticism out there. I personally, in my observation, see a lack of appropriate feelings when I see uh, Latter-day Saint leaders uh, typically speaking from the pulpit. If in theory that you're speaking as prophets of God and you're speaking with the authority of God, speaking the words of God, speaking to the people of God, that, that there's, there's something for Christians about the event of the preaching of the word of God which makes uh, an earnestness appropriate uh, where you're hoping to not only reflect the content and the truth of the text, but the manner and the attitude of the text. Absolutely. And uh, as outsiders, when we look in, and I wouldn't make this a primary criticism because sometimes I, I think there's Protestant preachers that could uh, improve in this well, so this isn't uh, one of my top criticisms. But, Certainly not. but it's, it seems only appropriate that if somebody claims to be a Christian that they open themselves to a, a wide range of, of feelings that perhaps you'd see in the book of Psalms. And so I, I would in, invite my Latter-day Saint neighbors here to consider, uh, I think I call it soporific. It's kind of sleep-inducing the, uh, and I say this with seriousness, the, 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 the cadence, and the manner and the mode of speaking at General Conference. Uh, I, I don't think that's appropriate for someone who claims to, to speak for God. Uh, and it's not absolute. It's, you know, sometimes somebody speaks like that. Maybe you should still take them seriously based on the content, but... Um, if someone's going to preach the word, hey, preach the word. Uh, and, and this might be helpful, too. If, if you're visiting a born-again Christian evangelical church, the range of emotion that you're going to experience a, a Christian preacher using typically is going to stretch you <laughs> if you're coming from a Latter-day Saint background. That's okay. Just let it, let it sit for a bit and, and test it. But any final words, Luke? Oh, yeah. I, I would just go back to that uh, at the end of the day, the truth of the gospel, what Jesus said about how we have eternal life, what his apostles and prophets and the Old and New Testament told us about what the gospel is, that is center. I know that that is true however I feel. And so therefore I labor to bring my heart and my feelings in line with what God has said is true. And then within that truth to experience uh, though that, that full range of human emotion appropriately. Sorrow at my sin, wonder and marvel and enthusiasm at, at everything I can know of the, the amazing, astounding God who transcends all that I could imagine, and, uh, and, and love, compassion, sincerity for my brothers, which may include mourning and grief at times. It's not always happy feelings and good feelings, but it is the right feelings as God has, has laid them out and given them to us in this world he's created, that he, is, he rescues us from the fall in his gospel. And that's where, I'd, uh, that's where I'd leave that. Thanks a lot, Luke. Grace and peace and good night to you all.